Hi, um, good day to you. Um, this is another episode of Once Upon a Time with Rinpoche with Pastor David, that's me. And um, today we're going to be delving into my experience with Tem Rinpoche, His Eminence Tem Rinpoche, when he first, he gave my first teaching. Obviously it was not Rinpoche's first, but it was my first, my, my experience and my thoughts about it. And that's what we're going to be delving into today. All right. So as usual, this was already um, pre-recorded because um, the the actual recording of the live stream, I accidentally deleted it. So I have to re-record it, and I may not have expressed everything that I had intended. But I hope I have some notes. So, but. Um, you know, sometimes when it's live, a lot of interactions, so I apologize for that. But anyway, so it's going to be recalling the first teaching. That's the topic today. All right, so um, without further ado, let me think. So I have to roll back the years, you know, rewind back. I met Rinpoche in around 2003, somewhere around 2003 or 2004. I sat in Rinpoche's teachings for the very first time and um, it was very different because uh, for me I've not experienced sitting in a Dharma teaching before and um, it was an occasion where SARS was going on that time I remember and Rinpoche was giving a teaching um, to do with a practice it's called uh, Black Garuda yeah, it's a teaching that, it's a practice, sorry, it's a meditational practice, a recitation of a particular mantra, soliciting a particular deity, a Buddha deity, in a form of a Garuda. All right? So this practice helps to purify the karma to get infectious diseases. So that's the purpose of the practice. So along the, along the way, I mean, we, we, it was a teaching in Kachara Paradise. And Kachara Paradise was an outlet that was founded by Rinpoche in order to make available um, Dhamma wares, you know, Dhamma statues, Tibetan Buddhist statues, Tibetan Buddhist uh, offering items, bowls, um, uh, the sensory offerings. Because in the, in the days, and in, in during that time, there was not much, there are not many places where you can find things like that. So it was meant for that to provide, especially for, for you know, for Rumji's friends and Rumji's students. So I have not been to Kachara Paradise much before. Prior to that, I think once or twice. And then I was invited to this teaching. And I was really excited because I've never sat in Rumji's teachings before. And from my experience, it was before that, it was... Um, it was mainly, you know, in, in conversation, Rinpoche is talking about something else, and then somehow Dharma came into the into the picture, in the convers in, into the conversation, and Rinpoche will give an explanation. But that's part of a conversation. So this is going to be a Dharma talk. So I've never actually said before. So it was interesting because when I went into the shop, and uh, it's not a very big shop, there's a lot of things, it was crowded. I think there, would, there was easily... 20, 30, 30 plus people that time. And we were just sitting knee to knee, you know, we we're just sitting on the floor and Rinpoche was on a chair. And, um, but it was amazing. I can tell you the experience of sitting, watching Rinpoche is amazing. It's, I mean, even for you who, some of you, not all of you, but some of you who have never met Rinpoche live, it's totally different. If you watch Rinpoche on a TV or on a computer screen, um, it's very 2D, but when you watch Rimichi live, when he teaches, it has a different experience. It was a, it was a completely different experience. And that's what I felt. So it was the first time I was experiencing it live, you know, Rimichi, and the energy and the way Rimichi talk and the way Rimichi... Rimichi has, is, has one of those rare qualities in which he can, he can read the crowd. I, would, I mean, I, I, that's the closest I can come to describe it, I read the crowd in a sense of what people feel and think and talk based on that, uh, on the feeling of um, whatever he perceives of the crowd. So it, so that's why I usually hear from people is, oh, you know, along the course of the teaching, Rinpoche answered my question. I had a question in mind and uh, Rinpoche answered it. Or along the way, Rinpoche just knew and Rinpoche would crack jokes that 
most you know Rimji would say things and crack jokes that everybody found funny and uh, sometimes many of the times like for me I've never seen Rimji live I don't really know Rimji that well that, at that point and I, it was just amazing it was just a tr totally amazing uh, experience and it was not it was not boring that's the amazing part it was dharma you know it was dharma it was not boring it was entertaining most of the times it was enlightening and it was uh incredible just incredible i don't know how to explain it better so that was my first experience and Rinpoche was teaching about a practice and along the course of the teaching um Along the course of the teaching, Rinpoche gave Rinpoche. There's a few things that happened during that teaching. Rinpoche, one of the main the main purpose was actually to, to explain this practice, the Black Garuda practice, and then the secondary was Rinpoche was giving a, a general Dharma talk to all of us. And one of the things that Rinpoche said during the Dharma talk was, um, it was just hit me point blank. You know, I don't know how to say this better, in a sense that at that point I was not convinced with Rinpoche yet. To be honest, I was still examining Rinpoche. I was still wondering, is this a path I want to choose to go along? You know, I was like, because I, um, I was thinking, don't convert me. I, I actually told that to Rinpoche, don't convert me. Point blank. <laughs> I think in the other sharing, I, I, I spoke about that. So what happened was, um, I was still in that frame of mode. That, 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 that thinking, you know, don't convert me. I'm not interested, not really interested, but interested. I intellectually, whatever Rimichi is telling me, you know, made me, um, I was learning something from it. I was interested, but at the same time, I wasn't sure. So, but of course, I'd never expressed that to Rimichi. And um, what happened was, um, in the middle of the teaching, Rimichi said, I'm not here to look for students. I don't want students. Rimji said that. He said, honestly, I'm not looking for students. I am just here to share the Dharma. And um, as the Buddha said, you can take any aspect of my te any part of my teachings, and if it applies to you, please go all the way with it and, uh, and put it into practice and gain its results. All right, so that's what Rimuji said, and when he said it, obviously it's much better than how I'm saying it right now, but um, much more eloquent, much more elaborate, and much more with examples, and and uh, much better than what I'm telling tell you. But I just remember what at that time is exactly what I needed to hear, because at that point, I my my mind shifted, and at that point I was thinking, this is the teacher I want to be with. This is a teacher I'm looking for. I never knew I needed a teacher, but this is the teacher I need, I'm looking for. And I'm, I, and um, and and the, the dream about the third person, you know, the third person. I mentioned in the other sharing that, that a psychic told me that there'll be a third person who's going to change my life. This is it. This is the person. And the dream I had when I met Rinpoche that um, he's going to change my life. This is it. So I've convinced. I'm convinced. I wanted to take refuge. I wanted to be a Rimji student. At that point, I remember thinking, and I was like blown away by the teaching. I was convinced, and um, I never looked back. Of course, along the way or throughout the years, there are many times I had doubts. When you, when you are in the Dharma for a while, for many, many years, doubts is bound to happen. And it's just how you deal with your doubts, whether the doubts is in, in your teacher, in the lineage, in the teachings. Of course, uh, well, if you ask me now, you, you know, how, you know, that's not a good way to address your doubts. Like if it's in the teachings and the teacher, then um, are, you, are we qualified or not? So, but anyway, so on my point in telling tell you, what I'm trying to say is that um, I had my doubts along the way, but somehow, from the deepest part of me, believe that Rimichi is my teacher. That's it. And I've met him, and for some reason, I always felt, even from the beginning, there's some sort of very strong familiarity with Rimichi, as in, as if I knew him for a long time, but it was strange because we just met. That was the strangest part. And um, we just met, and we hit it off very, very closely, very well, you know. 
and uh, like with the best of friends in a sense and um of where there's some parts of Rinpoche's um um method and delivery was very very different in a sense that he's very um he's very direct he's very authoritative and um so you know it's not like any friend of mine so he's not just a friend you see it's not some friend you can you know joke around with and, and, and there's there's an air of authority in Rinpoche and there's there's air that you know at the same time it's very strange with Rinpoche from my early days my experience with Rinpoche at the same time it was also uh, Rinpoche is still very humble Rinpoche is still along with us and Rinpoche is very um you know, we like like just uh, very friendly, very genial. I think the word is genial, and um, with us. So, in during the course of the teaching, Rimichi said those words, and it convinced me that I wanted Rimichi to be my teacher. And um, and it was at during that period also I was thinking to, I was looking at the shells. I can't remember if it was that teaching, but perhaps it's a later teaching. Yeah, it could be a later teaching, but it's still in the beginning, you know, in the early years. I, I, I look on the shelf and the statue of Manjushi kind of look back at me. And not, I mean, I'm not, not saying the statue moved or looked at me, but it stood out for some reason. And I, I thought I wanted to get the statue. And first thought is I wanted to get the statue. Second thought that came followed by it was I want to offer it to Rimuchi. Yeah, that's what... what transpired that time and it was about 16 inches no sorry 12 inches not not that big it's 12 inches and um and i look at the price i was blown away because it was not affordable and but then i've thought about it and i look at my i so happened to have some i was just a little bit um my cash flow was a little fluid at the time so i had some things so i thought why not you know, and um, and the feeling was very, um, and my birthday is coming up. I remember during that period, uh, my birthday was coming up, and I was saying, and Rimichi just gave, in the between, Rimichi did say, gave a teaching about birthdays in the sense that birthday is a time, a period where we celebrate the ego. How do we celebrate ego? It's about me. Come celebrate with me. Be happy for me because I'm getting older. I'm get, supposedly getting wiser. And this is what Rinpoche said. You know, it's celebrating me, 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 you know. And you have to give gifts to me. You have to come celebrate, eat my cake, you know. Uh, come have a party with me, make me happy. So Rinpoche said, if um, for a practitioner, um, celebrating birthdays can also be used, can be also be celebrated in a different way. It can be a, uh, it's an occasion to collect merit. It can be an occasion to make offerings. You know, so Rimishi always recommends students of his during birthdays. Of course, if you don't celebrate me in birthdays and all, you know, we'll go through withdrawal symptoms and we'll be depressed. But anyway, so what happens is do both. That's what Rimishi said. So you celebrate, but don't just think about yourself. So sometimes make offerings. Do some charity work. Do something different. This is what Rimchi is trying to say. Do something different, a different dimension to a, a, a birthday celebration that marks our time on earth to make it more meaningful. You know, for, for me at that time, I was so blown away by that teaching because it's very true. I'm very like into me all these years. I'm always expecting a gift from my parents and, um, of, uh, you know, for my friends and birthday cakes and celebration. I thought... Yes, I've been very selfish all this time. And um, so that time I thought, why don't I offer Manjushri? And I love the meaning of Manjushri. At the time, it, 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 among all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, you know, the various deities, Tara, you know, Heruka, and all those, Vajrayogini, Vajapani, so many deities, but that one stood up because of the meaning of it. And that the meaning was, but Manjushri was the Buddha wisdom. And it's intellect, Gaining wisdom, gaining insight into the teachings, gaining understanding, becoming smarter, becoming more compassionate. So I, I like that meaning because I remember Rimji gave a little sharing about Manjushri as well. And I love the way Rimji said it and it inspired me. And um and 
you know, it was it was also the deity that Rimshi recommended for me. So anyway, I eventually on my birthday, I just before my birthday, I bought the statue and invited. I put it on a basket, I remember, and I put some potpourri because I saw how Rimshi made offered gifts to people. And the the how when Rimshi gives gifts like Rimshi gives statues as well and, and all sorts of things and he will go through a lot of effort to present the gift. It's not something like you put in a paper bag and nah, this is your gift. Rimshi never do things like that. So I, I just saw saw what how Rimshi did it and I just followed. So I put it in a basket. I bought a basket and then um put it Majushi in there lying down and then I put I bought some potpourri. And then I bought some candles and some incense box, you know, the Tibetan incense in, in, in its packaging and put it together. And I thought it was somewhat presentable. <laughs> I was trying to be artistic. So I, I uh, and, you know, I arranged it nicely. And on my birthday, I told Rimuchi, I have, an, I have a gift for you. I didn't tell Rimuchi it was my birthday. Like, I just told Rimuchi, I have a gift for you. I'm offering for you. So I messaged him and then um, he, and I went to his place. That time Rimuchi and I was kind of like, quite close already reached a point where i can actually message Rimchi and go there and offer him a gift so i did and uh i remember Rimchi was like wow you know he went wow and um he 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 took it in and um and then i i was a little busy i told Rimchi i'll meet you another time i just you know i, I was going for a party lot basically a birthday party dinner and some you know clubbing with some friends obviously i, I can't remember it was a long time ago <laughs> so yes i remember doing that and then i remember Rimchi taking a picture of um of the statue and i still have the picture actually he he's he gave it to me many years later and i am still keeping it i don't know where what happened to the statue i think Rimichi gave it away to somebody but i remember Rimichi took a statue make an offering immediately for me and made prayers for me and years later Rimichi told me that the offering of the statue was extremely auspicious for me in a sense of um I cannot remember exactly what Rimuji said, but he said it was auspicious in the, because it was an offering from my heart to a to my to my teacher, and it was Manjushri. So it Rimuji said it created a cause for me to receive many many teachings in the future, and to be close to to him as 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 my teacher, like in a sense, to receive guidance and teachings, and it that created a cause for that. That's what Rimuji said. And um, because Rimuji, you usually I notice not just Rimuji, I notice a lot of the, especially the Tibetan teachers. The the first offering you offer um, your guru, your teacher, when you make um, when you let's say you take refuge or you met him for the first time, is indicative of our practice. It's like a portent. So for Rimuji, we he saw it as as that. So whatever it was, it was just a nice good memory for me, and. Um, it all arose from Rimuji's teachings in the beginning, the earlier, uh, the early, early teachings that I received from Rimuji. And Rimuji's style of giving teachings evolve over time, but the structure, I mean, the method is pre pretty much the same in a sense that. Um, Rimuji, when he gives teachings, um, yeah. it's 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 in a, in a sense of it's not just a formal discourse, and then he talks very formal. Rimuji tends to be slightly informal, and mo many of his teachings are on a personal basis to people, and impromptu. And um, many of the impromptu teachings were inspired by his students, inspired by the audience, like his friend or his or a student that came requesting um, Rimuji to do a blessing, whatever it is. And then sometimes Rimuji gain, gain some sort of inspiration from that and he will give a teaching. And um, yeah, that's usually the case. And sometimes it's uh, also another thing that Rimuji loves to do is he likes to surprise volunteers. So if uh, like people will come to Kachara, Kachara House, um, later on Kachara Forest Retreat, you know, um, when they come and do voluntary work, 
and he likes to in the middle of the voluntary it could be 10 o'clock 11 o'clock 12 o'clock sometimes there's some work that needs to be rushed so it's late and Rimchi will come in all of a sudden out of the blue no one no one is expecting it Rimchi would just barge in <laughs> literally and then um, say hello and then and then come and give them a little talk you know and many of the Rimchi teachings are like that of course, there is the formal one uh, in a sense that is on the throne in Kachara. And that's usually on formal occasions like his birthday. Um, maybe less his birthday. He doesn't really like to celebrate that. Um, more like Lama Tsongkhapa Day, Vesak Day, you know, more formal occasions. And um, sometimes uh, when he feels there's need to give teachings as well, he will, he will you know, arrange for us to... For the, for the place to be ready. And then, Rinpoche always believe in education, in, um, in learning the Dharma. He placed particular emphasis for us, especially for us uh, who come to Kachara to work, to receive a stipend for Kachara. Later on, it evolved into this organization of, of a lot of people who, will get, who gets a stipend. And um, so what happens is uh, Rinpoche wants to make sure that it's not a job, it's not work. So he takes a lot of effort in ensuring that whatever we do is not just a job and work. Meaning it's not, what it means, what I'm trying to say is it's not just, oh, we come in and then do the work, whatever work it is, like sales or, or, um, or pujas or, or just feed the homeless or just, um, you know, arts and crafts for its sake, for the job's sake, that he, will, he always makes sure that we have, we, we have part of the curriculum, part of the, uh, uh, the job scope is to learn the Dharma. All right. So what Rinpoche believes is, is to make it the, the Dharma work meaningful. It's for us to learn the Dharma. And be why? Why is it important to learn the Dharma? It's because to improve, to be better, to become a better person, a better practitioner. And if you want to do Dharma work long term, to have a stable mind, Dharma is essential. Learning Dharma work is essential. So he's in instituted that in, in Kachara, in the sense all the Dharma staff, who is dharmically inclined, who is joining the, the organization, because there are some that, are, you know, it really is a... a a career in a sense on secular and maybe some of them some there are people who, who are from a different faith who join Kachara as well obviously we don't force them to listen to Dharma when they don't really believe in it and they have a different faith which is fine if you don't you know if you come and join us in Kachara if you have it is just a job but if it's not a job then it's our duty to learn the Dharma along with just you know going to work and you know earning a paycheck because at the end of the day the end process the end result, not end process, the end result is the Dharma. It is to benefit someone. It could be very technical, our work, it could be very menial, but the end result is the Dharma. It is to spread the Dharma, it is to preserve the Dharma, it's to create infrastructure for the Dharma. Um, so, some, so it's important that we learn the Dharma as well. So our time in the Dharma will be longer because our mind will be more stable. If you don't learn the Dharma, I'll be mind, our minds will go up and down, up and down. Because this is the, the, the work in Kachara that we do is not, it's not to make money. That's not our purpose of Kachara. It's not to make money of anybody. It is not to, um, to profit anybody for, for anybody to gain a profit. In fact, we don't gain any profit. We, we do not. So that's the whole purpose. And uh, uh, at the beginning, right from the beginning, um, when I first you know, joined Rinpoche and all that, it was not apparent, but over time it became more apparent later on, all right, about what I just said. So recalling the first teaching. One of the things I wanted to share before I end this session would be... Um, Rimuji also takes a lot of effort, make sure like this. This is something that Rimuji makes sure that of his audience um, is that they are paying attention. Um, 
it's that they are receptive. Most important is they're paying attention and receptive. Otherwise, it would be pointless to sit in a teaching if you are, you know, asleep or not paying attention or your mind is you're there, but your mind is not there. Rinpoche calls it, no one, uh, the lights is on, but no one's home. He jokes about it that way. Meaning you are there, the lights are on, means it looks like you're there, but your mind is not there. No one's home, it means you're not there. <laughs> That's Rinpoche's joke. La. So this is something in the, it is referred to in the Lamrim as the, the, the faults of the three pots. So there's three pots, meaning three mental states. Uh, one of them is the pot is um, upside down. Okay, so water cannot, when you pour water in an upside down pot, it flows out. Okay, that's, the, that's the fault of not being there. But you know, when you're physically there, but your mind is away or you're falling asleep. Because nothing goes in. Because you, you just, you're just not, you're not receptive. It could be also, uh, yeah, whether you're falling asleep or your mind is not there or you're distracted. All right, that is the fault of the upside down pot. Then the other pot is the contaminated pot. The contaminated pot is means it's dirty. So when whatever you put inside is polluted by what by the dirt. So in in, a, in the meaning of it is that um, if when you go for teachings, your purpose of going for teachings is perhaps not dharmic. Perhaps it's about um, you're going there actually you are more interested in the girls or the boys or whatever, you know, or making money, or making connections for your MLM business, or whatever it is. So that is an issue with, with Dharma, in a sense that then you won't, get, you won't get the full benefit. For some people, usually, this, this part, one thing about this part is, if the, if the teacher is skilled, like Sam Rinpoche is, Rinpoche definitely is, even if you come in with a, a different motivation, you can be swayed, you can be changed by listening. Um, but for some Dharma teachers, for, for, for myself, I may not be able to sway you, so it would be pointless. All right? That's a, a polluted pot. Then there's a crack pot. A crack pot is a scenario where we are forgetful. So whatever we have listened, we have forgotten. We, do, we are unable to retain it for whatever reasons. Uh, perhaps the language is difficult. Perhaps it was delivered in a way that uh, we, we couldn't remember it. And um, so from the side of the listener, for a Dharma practitioner, we should avoid this part by going for teachings as much as we can or revising our teachings. And especially if we are studying something like the Lamrim, it is always important to read the Lamrim afterwards or beforehand and go for the teaching or um, to always study the Dharma, always listen to teachings. Don't think that, oh, we've been, I've been in the Dharma for like 10 years. I don't need to listen to any more basic teachings. I'm looking for more advanced teachings. Because there's a lot of advanced Dharma, pra uh, Dharma practitioners who are older in the Dharma. And they think that they, they don't need to study anymore, like Lam Rim, not necessarily study the Rim, no need. So, uh, but actually, we can forget. Why we can forget? Very simple, because We've not, we have not gained any realizations from it. And if you have gained realizations from it, then all the more we should, we, we will realize that it's important to plant imprints in our mind. Continuous plant more imprints because we are not attained. We're not a Buddha yet. We are just on the path. So as long as we are on the path to becoming a Buddha, even the very basic teachings is very important. It's very powerful blessings for us as Dharma practitioners. That's what Rinpoche used to tell us. And he, he would tell us the story of his teacher. His teacher is um, a uh, Shapa Choje, if I'm not mistaken. One of his teachers is a Shapa Choje, one of the masters in, 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 uh, in, his, in the monastery. A Shapa Choje is a, a very high position in the monastery. There's just before the, the main patriarch or the main head of the Guluk tradition, the Gandhan Tripa, and then the Shapa Choje, Jangse Choje. So, in other words, that position is for someone who is extremely learned. He will still go to Lamrim teachings, Lamrim, uh, Lamrim teachings given by his, his, um, his teacher who is of a lower position, who doesn't have any high rank in the monastery. 
okay, Lati Rinpoche, I remember Rinpoche said. So he would still go for Lam Rim teachings. And Rinpoche asked him once, why do you still need to go, why do you still go for Lam Rim teachings when you're already such a great master? And he, his answer was that I still need to plant imprints in my mind, in my mind stream. I'm not a Buddha yet. I need to plant imprints. It's important for me when I, especially when I die. So I'm preparing for my death. So imprints and blessings are very important, especially about of the Lamrim. So for such a learned master to think like that, all the more, what Rinpoche is telling us is all the more for us to always continuously learn, imprint ourselves, collect merit, because we never know, you know, when we, our time is up or when um, our merits run, run low and we decide that one day we don't want to practice the Dharma anymore. So if we have a store of merits, a store of blessings, imprints, then that such a scenario may the chances of it, of that happening may not be so high you know so that's all i wanted to share and um uh regarding my first teaching my earlier teachings like not just my first my earlier teachings you have any questions anything comes to mind for the three cups that we have mentioned mm. today, is there anything that the practitioners can do for example setting the correct motivation does it help in Trying to get rid of the, the faults of the three, the three pots. Okay, one of the things that we should always do, in avoid, in order to avoid um, the faults of the three, especially the one that is the upside down, falling asleep during teachings. A lot, of, even the most advanced practice, some of them are very, very, you know, they, the moment they hear a teaching, they feel very sleepy, and that is, uh, and it, you don't know why. Although they had a lot of sleep, they're very, very fresh, but they feel sleepy. They can't control themselves. It's because of obscurations. There's a type of karma that we can collect um, that obstruct us from listening to the Dharma. And and tense when when the, when there's a Dharma teachings, a lot of people find it very sleepy, and they don't know why. Because they, although they have, it's because of this karma. And this karma arises from a few things. It arises from disrespecting the Dharma. How do you disrespect? Sometimes, many of the times, not sometimes, many of the times you disrespect the Dharma unknowingly, but there's still karma. Whether you know or you don't know, there's still karma because of the object. So how do you disrespect the Dharma, like Dharma books? We pl place them on the floor, we step over it, we, we, you know, we place it with uh, worldly books. Um, that's one. The way we treat Dharma books, we, sh we should always place them on a higher position. It should be away from worldly books samsara books because there's karma involved there's trace karmas okay small small karmas i'm saying so you and we should not step over it we should not disrespect it in that way the, all these are actions that disrespect that has karma karmic repercussions that will come back to us making us very sleepy and then another one is our altar if you have a shrine with an altar it's to always change the offerings make sure your offerings are fresh Make sure it is never go stale, never have um, dust and dirt and all that collect on, on your altar, on your offering, especially your offering items. Okay, because uh, this is one way of disrespecting Dharma. So the karma that comes back to us is called, Rimaji calls it drip. It's not an English word, drip is a Tibetan word. It's not water dripping, no, no, it's not. The, the Tibetan word for drip is uh, obscurations. Okay, obscurations that makes us very sleepy when we listen to the Dharma. So make sure our offerings are clear. And especially when we offer flowers, you know, that we put some water in there and make sure that water is always changed. If you're going to offer flowers, you have to be aware about, about that because the water does, even just after one day, it can become very smelly. And then there's the karmic repercussion because you offer it. All right, so um, is, is this tool you, we should be mindful of? And then when we go for teachings, um, one of the things that Rinpoche recommend, don't be too comfortable in teachings. If you're sitting in a teaching or you're listening to a teaching, maybe it's not a live teaching, maybe it's a recorded teaching, don't be too comfortable. Try not to listen to teachings and fall asleep. And use it as a, as a method to fall asleep. Then it's not very respectful to the Dharma. All right. If you want to fall asleep, you can do mantras. That is fine. Extra additional mantras that's not your sadhana, you can use that. Don't listen to teachings in order to fall asleep. All right. Don't train yourself to listen to the Dharma to fall asleep. That's not good. Although you do find it sleepy when you hear that, it's not good. All right. And um, and when you do sit on a live teaching, don't get comfortable. 
don't like oh because the aircon is on then you wrap yourself it's so warm so comfortable and then you your, your chair is so comfortable and then you, when you're very very comfortable it's very easy to fall asleep and the way you sit try not to slump down and be so comfortable because that makes it easy for you to fall asleep so it's just few steps you need to do to, to avoid this this is a few things Rimaji told us in the, in the past um, we got when it comes to teaching because we should have some due respect if you want to learn the Dharma we follow these few things in order to gain the best benefit you can gain, gain from the Dharma teaching and um, if you're sleepy look up don't look down you know that's one of the things it, this is especially used in a meditation when you're in meditation and you're very very sleepy not not sleepy uh, but if you're you're feeling a bit dull so you look up same thing but it doesn't solve all if you're very very sleepy if you're very very sleepy and listening to teachings have coffee take a break have a coffee practical ways to avoid that then when you send a teaching then um then you avoid that the the fall of the three pots and uh, i mean the the hardest one will be the the, the polluted one like the dirty pot in the sense that if you have wrong motivation i can't really say lah you know but um, if the teacher is skilled, then he, he or she may be able to convince you. But ultimately, Dharma is not about making money. Dharma is not about um, finding a partner. Okay, uh, don't look for deities and exotic practices to help you with money and all that. There is, there is, I'm not denying that it's existence, but that's not the ultimate purpose of it of dharma if you're already in dharma for long and you want you're wishing to study lamrim and all that then you we have to to have the right motivation in the lam even in the lamrim there's three scopes you know and if you are thinking of worldly benefit then it doesn't even come into any of the scopes you are in the sub-zero scope i don't know <laughs> so yeah so um i, I hope that I kind of address what you're saying basically all right, thank you very much. That comes to the end, and I hope it benefits all of you guys. Thank you.